ta-da are we working are we good let's check Facebook um, let's see maybe not okay Facebook I have to have a different camera all right I don't know why I can't oh there we go and we're live what's up everybody I've missed y'all oh I've missed y'all so much hey Krishana girl shout out to V Slate. you know what's so crazy I just got the email you sent me today too so I do need to put another order in Turn that down. But what's up, everybody? So let's talk. What's been happening? Um, I've been meaning to do this live for a couple of days now, but y'all know it's my birthday. So try to sell my head out my heart because child, I just wanted to have I wanted to celebrate my birthday without doing work. I love y'all dearly, I do, but at the same time, it's just like, come on now. I needed a break. So um, I do want to do this live tonight. We're going to be talking about removing auto repossessions and identifying illegal auto repossessions. And the reason why that's kind of like a hot button topic right now is because the CFPB released a statement saying that they did a little investigating um, of pandemic era repossessions and they noticed that a lot of these repossessions were conducted illegally. And so they kind of put the companies on notice or these lien holders on notice that there are going to be some changes. Um, and so they also gave consumers kind of like a heads up on what to look out for when it comes to identifying an illegal repossession and what that means for your credit report. Oh, thank you so much. And what that kind of means for your credit report. Um, first things first, it is very important for you to understand that a repossession in and of itself does not necessarily make it illegal. If you're not paying your bills, then the company, you know, has the right to come get their things. However, how they conduct that repossession is kind of what determines the legality of it. Um, there are certain rules and things like that, that these companies have to follow in order for it to be considered a legal repossession. So, First things first, right? So it's very important that you guys understand your state laws. Every state is different. So you want to make sure that you are able to identify what your state specifically outlines um, for how a vehicle is repossessed. Now, I would say, do especially for those of you who are in the military, you definitely want to do your due diligence because you want to make sure that the state you live in currently and the state that you lived in when you signed for your vehicle, make sure that you know the laws for both of those states because... Um, depending on the state you currently live in, they could go by the previous state or they can go by the state that you live in now. And if you move around a lot, that kind of applies to you too, but that's mainly for my military people because I know we move around, around a lot. Now, how to identify whether or not an, a repossession is illegal is based on your knowledge of what is considered a legal repossession. This means that you received all of the disclosures that you're supposed to have. This means that um, all of the notif or the notifications that you're supposed to receive, like you're supposed to get a letter saying, hey, we're going to go ahead and repo your car. Um, hey, we tried to repo your car. Like, you know, we can't find you. Can you give us a your location or something like that? They need to give you notifications to let you know that your car has entered a repossessed status, right? And to tell you what the amount is in order to get it out of that status. So if you skipped a couple payments, it's usually going to be the amount that you owe, um, like all of those missed payments plus whatever late fees you've assessed. Now, there are options before you get to the repossessed stage. A lot of people think that if I just skip my payments, I have nothing to worry about, right? Like, you know, eventually I'll be able to catch up. For a lot of, and a lot of people do that, but you don't even have to. You could contact your lien holder and be like, listen, you know, times are hard. What do I have to do to get a deferral? A deferral is when they take your payment and put it on the end of your loan. So it kind of extends the life of your loan, but it will keep you from getting that late payment. Remember, late payments or missed payments, that's 35% of your credit score right there. So if you really, you know, you just, times are hard, right? Money is tight. There are ways for you to work the system in your favor without still getting that derogatory, um, annotation on your credit. So that's kind of like a heads up. Now, 
when you, let's say it does enter a repossess status, right? And you get the notification that they are going to attempt to repossess your vehicle. There are certain things that they are not allowed to do well, and, and that they have to do. So number one, they have to contact the state I mean, in the city or county or whatever it is that you live in because they have to notify the police that your car is going to be repossessed. Because if you come outside and your car is gone, of course you're going to think that your car is stolen. Like, I don't think any, I mean, unless you catch them repossessing your car, of course you're going to instantly think your truck, your car was stolen. So you're def they have to contact the police department um, in order to let them know that they're going to be, or your vehicle has entered a repossession status. Now, if you have a fenced in property, um, if you have a garage that you usually keep the vehicle in and things like that, those things are going to prohibit them from repossessing the vehicle because it is illegal for them to, um, access private property without your consent in order to repossess the vehicle. I think that's like the number one thing a lot of people don't know. Um, so like when they come on your property and things like that, if it's fenced in and they have to take the fence down or if they have to open the fence to get in, um, you know, you, you just really want to be careful with where you're leaving your car. If you don't want it repossessed, I would suggest leaving it in a garage where they can't get to it or a locked fence. The lock is very important because they would have to go out of their way to come in and get your vehicle. And without your consent, entering your property like that, that's illegal. If they call the police, the police cannot aid in a repossession. They cannot tell you to give these people the keys. They cannot force you to comply with the repossession. Um, the police are literally there just to keep the peace, to keep you and the person attempting to repossess the property from fighting. If a police officer interferes in the repossession um, or make you give up the keys or they help the agent in any way um, to repossess your vehicle, that is considered illegal. So not only can you sue the lien holder, but you can also sue the police department because that goes against what their policy is. And that doesn't even matter what city, state, county that you live in, that goes against what they're, they're allowed to do as law enforcement. Um, now, the reason, like I said, the reason why this became a hot button topic is because, listen, with the pandemic and their investigation, and then with this war on Ukraine, what this means is there are going to be a rise in repossessions, even more so, right? Number one, used vehicles right now are a hot commodity because those chips are really hard to get. And so they're about to start being shorter and shorter with people who are already on a short leash. So there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be getting repossession letters soon. So it's very important that, you know, you are able to identify whether or not you're you're on that threshold or whether or not you're like, look, I've been missing payments because I've been trying to get my money together for this, but all right, I'm going to go ahead and put some money on it to keep it from entering that status because they're going to be looking for any reason to come snatch these cars. And then once they do, they're going to be trying really, really hard to get them right back out. Now, if you have... Now, that's another thing I also want to bring up. I did a TikTok one because a lot of people didn't know, but a voluntary repossession and an involuntary repossession, they reflect is the same exact thing on your credit report. It's a derogatory account. No matter whether you surrendered the vehicle or not, that is still a derogatory account on your credit report. And it's very important that you understand that before making the decision to do something like that, because it's derogatory regardless. Um, now, if your vehicle is repossessed, it is supposed to be sold. When it is going to be sold, when like after they take it and they have it at the lot and it's going to be sold, you are supposed to receive um, a notification saying, hey, um, we have the car. We're going to sell it at this date and time at this auction, at this location. Um, you do have the opportunity to come back and, you know, rebuy the vehicle. Um, and so if you don't and the car is sold, then usually what they will do is they will subtract the amount that you owe um, from the amount that they sold it for. I mean, I'm sorry, backwards. They will subtract the amount they sold it for from the amount you owe. And there will always usually be a balance left over depending on how the auction goes. Now, you are still responsible for that auction. Once they take that vehicle and sell it, yes, the property no longer belongs to you, but you still have a balance owed. Whether it's a couple hundred dollars or a couple thousand dollars, you still owe that money. Now, if you do not, that's when repossessions are doubly negative, right? They're, they're doubly derogatory on your credit because not only did you have a repossessed vehicle, but you had a repossessed vehicle that had a balance that you did not pay. If you do not close out that account and that account still has a balance on it, then yes, um, they can take you to court. They can sell it to collections. There's a plethora of things that these companies can do to pursue you for that debt. But legally, as long as they have given you all of the proper disclosures, you still owe that money. Now, 
to remove a repossession is the same as removing any other derogatory account on your credit report using factual disputing. First, you need to be able to identify the things. How is it supposed to reporting? So you need to know things like your VIN number. You need to know your account number with the lien holder. You need to know things like when was it repossessed? Where was it sent? What is your state laws regarding repossessions and the process that it entails? You need to know the intimate details of the actual account. Any paperwork that you had, you're going to want to have it on file because... What I'm saying, like, you want to have that kind of stuff on file because if you can identify an inaccuracy, an error, or a violation, remember, those are the three things you need to be looking for when you guys are looking at accounts to dispute on your credit. You need to be looking for either an error in the way that it's reporting, so maybe um, balances are off, or maybe, you know, um, dates are more than 30 days apart or something like that on your credit report. If you can identify a violation in the FCRA in the way that it's reporting, so maybe this is a closed account that's reporting as open, um, you know regardless of what you identify, you want to identify some kind of something wrong with this account in order to dispute it. But before you start doing that, I really need you guys to understand the consequences of that action. Just because you want something removed or just because you dispute something does not mean that that something is going to come off. So you need to understand what happens if you just in case you lose a dispute. Now, repossessions are the most sued debt. If you go on Pacer, you can search for yourself um, to see that a lot of these companies, once you start disputing, if you lose that dispute, they're going to take you to court because with repossessions, these are considered high dollar debts. I always tell people that a high dollar debt is anything, any amount that you would fight somebody over if they owed you, that is considered a high dollar debt. And so with most repossessions, it's a couple thousand dollars. So you want to make sure that <laughs> you got your ducks in a row or at the very least you have some money to offer in the event that you lose this repossession. Because if you, I mean, not, not the repossession, in case you lose this dispute, because if you lose this dispute and then they take you to court and then they see to you then you're going to have a judgment and that's another derogatory mark on your credit so it's just like it's kind of like a series of unfortunate events if you're not planning properly so again if you are going to dispute your repossession you need to make sure that you understand the consequences of that action because if they do validate that debt then that not only re-ages the debt because that resets the statute of limitations depending on what state you live in due to the fact that this is now considered new activity on this validated account, but um, you're also making it to where now, they had, now they're going to take a closer look at your account. Like, oh, you're right, you didn't pay us, and since you're acting like you don't want to pay us, let's just go to court over it. And they'll end up getting, this can equal like wage garnishments, they can take taxes, things like that, like... So many things can go wrong if you're not planning this property properly. It's not enough to just want these items off. Is it best to dispute the repo after the car has been sold and the balance has been paid? Um, it's up to you to decide on when you want to dispute the account. I always tell people that the thing that you have to understand is that when you are using, um, depending on the method that you are using to dispute this repossession. So if you use the method where you're identifying an inaccuracy in the way that it's reporting, you need to be able to identify an inaccuracy and prove that it is actually inaccurate because you want to prove that they are being willfully non-compliant with the FCRA. That violates your rights. So, oh my God, that UPS truck is so loud. Um, you want to be able, you have to be able to prove that it's not enough to just want it off even after you've paid it. You also need to understand what is, what is considered a valid debt. How do you validate a debt? Because you want to make sure that you don't validate it involuntarily. Um, and then now you're really stuck with it. Are they supposed to send you a letter that they are repossessing the vehicle? They have to prove that they have attempted to communicate with you regarding the repossession, whether that's missed calls or notifications in the portal that they have that you make payments in um, or emails or something like that, but they have to prove that they've been attempting to contact you regarding your vehicle's repossession. I owe 20 K on a vehicle when it was repossessed, it's zero balance now and it'll show one more year. Okay. That wasn't a question. And that has nothing to do with what we're talking about right this second. I no longer have my car and the account is open and reporting late payments. This is likely due to the fact, uh, due to the company not closing the account. So if the vehicle was repossessed, the vehicle, the, uh, if the vehicle was repossessed and sold, and that's why you no longer have the car, then this is considered a closed account, and you need to contact that company to see why is it still reporting as open with missed payments. Um, and if there's something that you're missing, then that's something that they also need to disclose to you. Um, what if they are reporting two different balances on a repossessed vehicle? That is a means for a dispute. 
that is something that you can use to force a debt validation because the amounts are different. The balances should never be off. If Equifax is saying you owe $1,000, TransUnion should not say that you owe 2000 They need to match. The company should be saying the same exact thing to each credit bureau that is reporting. Now, that's not to say that they have to report to all three bureaus because no, they do not. Sometimes people only report to one. Sometimes people report to two. Um, however, if they are reporting, it has to be the same information across the board. The only wiggle room they really get is with dates. The dates can't be any more than 30 days apart. They are off by over $2,000 for the past three years. Then you can use that right there to force a debt validation. Now, when you're doing this debt validation, you don't want to tell them right out the gate exactly what's wrong. You want them to be like, you need to, and this is what I tell people all the time about skipping steps, right? So we talk about how you shouldn't skip steps because you can kind of like unknowingly put your foot in your mouth and validate that debt. And so if you just go through the process. So I do my bureau reinvestigation letter, kind of putting them on notice that I would like to dispute an item. And then after I dis I do that and they like, oh, well, you know, this is how it's supposed to be reporting. If they verify that this information is reporting accurately, but you have proof otherwise, this is now considered willful noncompliance because you let them know that they're reporting inaccurately and they're refusing to make any changes. They're refusing to investigate. From there, you'll do a method of verification. How was this information verified? They'll tell you we spoke to the company directly. You can do a debt validation with the company directly. Now, the, the debt validation means they're going to send you all evidence tied to this account. This, any paperwork, the contract, the original contract that you signed at the car dealership, um, and any paperwork that ties you specifically to this debt is what needs to be sent. It's not enough just for them to say that you owe money. They have to prove that not only a debt is owed, but that it's you. So it'll usually be like something from the lien holder that shows the remaining balance, proof of missed payments, et cetera, et cetera. You are looking for signatures. You are looking for identification verifications. You are looking for anything that specifically ties you to this debt that'll hold up in court. If they have it, okay, this is considered a valid debt. If they do not have it, if a debt cannot be validated, then legally it has to be removed from your credit report and they have to cease attempts to collect and they have to cease attempts to report. My report shows 30 day late multiple times back to back. Okay, were you late? What happened if it was redeemed the day after the repossession, but reporting a repossession on the credit report? You can always ask the company to update it. Um, like, hey, listen, this account is no longer in a repossessed status. Can you please update the account to reflect that with the credit bureaus? You can always ask that. I always tell people it never hurts to ask questions. Something else a lot of people didn't know. So I tell people this all the time. Whenever you, let's say your car enters a repossessed status, right? And you just don't got the money right now. First thing you need to do, and you get that notification that they're coming to take your car, go out there and take pictures of the car. Go out there and take pictures of the, the, um, the condition of the vehicle. Because if the vehicle is damaged during the repossession process, then you can use that to argue that that made it an illegal repossession because they did not repo the vehicle without uh, damaging the vehicle or maybe like they broke a fence or something at your house trying to get the car. You can also use that to like leverage it and be like, this was an illegal repossession. Like it's little things. This is why it's so important for you guys to know your state laws because there's little stuff like that that you can use to get it taken off your credit report which is obviously the ultimate goal, right? Now, in the event that a repo, you know, you do a debt, you go through all the steps, you do the debt validation, and it comes back as a valid debt, what are your options? I tell people all the time, especially because most people only come to me when they're looking to buy homes, right? Or looking to rebuild their credit for another car. You're going to want to pay it, period. And I know a lot of y'all see the videos where people are saying like, oh, you don't have to pay repossessions and evictions and student loans and things like that to take it off your credit. And that's cute. And it makes for a good TikTok video and a lot of views. However, it's not reality. Because when you don't pay these things, they, they count negatively towards you. Even if you dispute it off of your credit report, right? And so it's gone while it's under investigation. And you apply for new things and they don't necessarily see it right then and there. Um, when they pull your credit the first time, right? Or, you know, maybe um, they don't check. I don't know. Maybe something just happens and they don't necessarily see that repossession um, at the first look on your credit, right? When you go to sign that paperwork and they run it officially um, to be like, okay, we are going to go ahead and give you this vehicle. Here is your actual credit report and not your um, like projected or whatever the case may be. 
Um, and they see that repo that can cause your payments to go up. That can cause them to take the, the deal off the table because you not only owe them still, because remember there's an unpaid balance. So you not only owe them still, but that's an indicator like, yo, you don't pay your bills. And if that happened to them, that can happen to us. Like what, like what's the difference between this company and us? So unfortunately, even though it sounds cute that, and a lot of people don't want to pay when you have repos, you're going to have to pay that money if you lose that dispute. And you can either pay it willingly, right? Or you can go ahead and likely what will happen if you validate, if that debt is considered valid, right? And you reset the statute of limitations and they take you to court, you're going to end up with a wage garnishment if you cannot come up with a payment arrangement with the company. Can you get a bankruptcy from a repo removed if you were the co-signer from your credit report? Huh? Okay, so... Hmm. Okay, let me... So you were a co-signer for a card that was repossessed and included in a bankruptcy. I think is what you're saying. Now, here's the thing about that. Unfortunately, original creditors or OG creditors, right? They are obligated to report the history associated with an account. So even though you are a co-signer, this account can still report um, because that is a part of the history of the account. Does that make sense? So the only way that you would be able to get that off, right? And this is going to sound like really convoluted, but like you're going to have to get the person who filed the bankruptcy to get the bankruptcy removed from their credit report, right? And then argue like, how can you please validate this account? Because there's no way this is a valid account because I never filed for bankruptcy and this person never filed for bankruptcy. So there's no way that this account is valid and we want to go ahead and have it taken off. And then obviously they'll have to conduct an investigation and blah, 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 blah. But in the event that it doesn't stand up, you know, they can use that to get that removed. Now, again, it's situational. You need to be able to identify, you know, inaccuracies and stuff because that will help your case because that proves that they did not do an investigation prior to reporting. And they can, it's illegal for a company to knowingly report false information on your credit report. <laughs> I don't see how you understand all of this. <laughs> to be honest, and, and you know, I get that a lot, especially from people who want to get into this field. You don't have to memorize everything as long as you know where to find it. Behind me, I have a bookshelf with, um, three ring binders of all the different laws. I have a stack of, I'll actually show you guys. I have a stack of what I call the credit Bible. I have a stack of those in my garage that I keep. I have them all literally all over my house. Um, and it's just repetition. I'm constantly dealing with people who have these same issues over and over. And so the solutions are kind of like embedded in my brain. And because I'm, I'm exposing myself to this information every single day, it just kind of sticks. Um, I really don't want you guys to be intimidated by the knowledge because it is a lot and it's constantly changing. The FDCPA was just amended in November. Um, so there was some things that I had to unlearn and then things I had to, you know, learn again. So, you know, it's just the more you're exposed to it, the more it just kind of sticks. It's literally like that. But I want to show you guys what my, um, I want to show you guys what my, uh, the credit Bible book looks like. I don't, that's not what it's called, but that's what we call it. Hold on. I'll show you guys. Okay, so this is what I call my credit Bible. What if they are reporting charge off and collection every month? Hey, Eartha. So if they're reporting as a charge off or collection every month, that is illegal. That is considered a false manipulation of the date of last activity. Um, and what you'll have to do, you can use that to initiate a dispute. But I think a lot of people don't understand the difference between, yeah, you can file a dispute and actually winning the dispute. This is enough to file a dispute, right? But whenever you file a dispute, the company has to investigate. And the results of the investigation has to either be they update um, or correct whatever was wrong or they remove it. Right. So if you use, Oh, they did a charge off every month and now, and I know that's not true. That is why I'm asking you to remove that. That may not be strong enough to have your account removed, especially if everything else considers it a valid account. All they're going to do is just update that fact. 
That's another reason why I tell you guys, don't expose your hand too early in the dispute process. Be very vague. Just let them know like, yo, something is wrong with this and you need to fix it. And if they keep saying nothing is wrong, nothing is wrong, nothing is wrong, and you have proof that it is wrong, then in the, you know, once you get further down the dispute process and you expose that, and then they make the correction, this is considered willful noncompliance and you can have the account removed because of that. I know that's really comp. That sounds really complicated, but... The more inaccuracies you can find with an account, the better. But anyway, sorry, back to this. So this is my credit Bible. Um, this is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. This is a hard copy. You can get these for free if you go to ftc.gov. Ftc.gov. That's the website. Um, so if you are a educator or um, somebody who's heavy in their community, um, teaching financial literacy of any kind. Um, they have so many things that you can order for free from straight from the Federal Trade Commission because they are who are responsible for enforcing this. Um, they have so many things. I get worksheets, educator packets. Um, I get books. I get um, brochures. I get flyers. I get all of these things straight from the horse's mouth because I feel like, obviously, you know, if I, if I was to repurpose this content and put it out on a brochure that said the money plug... Anybody could pull it up and be like, oh my God, it's a lie. But if it specifically says, yo, this was received from the Federal Trade Commission, United States government, blah, 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 blah. That's a viable source, right? That's a legit source. These are the people who make the laws. So why not listen to them? Um, and so those are items that I use when I do pop-up shops or when I you know, speak at events and things like that. Those are the things that I pass out to people um, so that they can have the most accurate information. Um, and again, all of it is free, so why not order it? Just go to ftc.gov and you can get a bunch of these. Where did you learn? I taught myself. So like I took classes, I took, I did workshops, I've read books, YouTube videos, podcasts. I've been to conferences. Um, if you are getting into this field, this is not for the weak of heart. This is not for people who are just going to wake up one day and make a t uh, Instagram or repeat something that they heard on TikTok and be like, oh, I'm a credit guru. I'm a credit expert. I'm the credit magician. Like everybody wants to have a persona now, apparently. Um, but like, that's not enough. That's not enough. And it's also not legal, but that's a completely different conversation. <laughs> It, that's not enough anymore. You need to know what you're doing. It's not enough to just be like, oh, send a 611 letter. Why are you sending that 611 letter? What are you adding to the 611 letter to make your case stand out from the hundreds of other cases that they see in a day? You see what I'm saying? So you need to understand the concepts that are behind this, whether you are a credit repair specialist or somebody who's repairing their credit themselves. It is very important that you guys put in the work and do the research to learn these things. Um, and I'm real, real big on on educating yourself on the different laws, not even just federal laws, which is what this is considered, um, but your state laws as well. And remember, whenever you're looking at state laws, it is always based on the state that you signed your contract in. So if you lived in South Carolina and you bought a car and then you moved to California, you're going to go off of the South Carolina laws. Is a charge off supposed to be reported monthly? No, it is not. That is considered a false manipulation of the date of last activity. Because you haven't done anything to that account to make it report every single month like that. And an account can only be charged off one time. You can't constantly charge off an account. It's only supposed to be charged off that one time. What other questions you guys got? Oh, you know what? Where is my phone? Oh, that's what I dropped on the floor, huh? Mine says charge off for the past five years. If it says charge off for the past five years, then you're definitely going to want to use that as grounds for a dispute. And you're definitely going to want to take a closer look at that account to see what else could be off. Um, For sure. It should not, every month you should not see charge off, charge off, charge off, charge off, charge off. You should see charge off for the month and year that it was charged off. It can only be charged off one time. They don't consistently fill out that tax paperwork every month. They fill it out one time and then that's it. I don't know why I didn't go live on Instagram. I'm going to go live on Instagram. I don't know why I didn't think of that. 
Mm. So here's the thing. Just because you hear that that's grounds for a dispute does not mean that you should automatically dispute it. That's all. Let's also start there. So I, and so um, was it last week or the week before um, I did a presentation for a church and I told the church that the word of the day is discernment, right? You're going to hear a lot of credit tips and things like that on my page. That's literally all my page is, is education tips or hacks or whatever you want to call them to fix your credit. But just because you you see this suggestion or just because you hear this suggestion does not mean that you should use it. Use discernment. If you only got like a year left, right, on something reporting on your credit and you're not looking to make a major purchase um, in that year, let it go. Don't touch it. If, if, you know, if you know this is a valid debt and you know that if you send in this letter, they are going to validate that debt. What up, Will? If you know that if you send this letter and they're going to validate that debt, then it's not even worth the dispute. It's not. You know what you owe, so then you need to start thinking settlement. If it's a collection, you need to start thinking pay to delete. You see what I'm saying? Discernment. Every tip isn't going to work for your credit profile. So you just need to know the intricacies of each account so that you know whether or not you should try something. It says charge off each month and different balances. Yeah, the balances should always be the same. No matter what bureau you're looking at, none of that. All of your balances should be the same. Can one dispute an open account because it's bad reporting? Here's how I feel about open disputing open accounts. So if something is wrong with an open account, I always suggest going to that company directly and having them fix it immediately. Because once you start disputing, you're getting into really muddy waters. And if they get the idea that you're trying to say that it's not you or you didn't do something or something like that, that's, that's fraud. Fraud means they're going to close the account. You don't want the account closed. That's not what you're wanting. You're wanting the account updated. So just be, you know, very clear and concise about what it is you want um, so that they can't misconstrue you or be like, well, we thought, you know, just be very clear and concise. And when you're doing these things, do it in writing. You, it's very hard to misconstrue something when it's in writing. Not only that, when it's in writing, these are considered legally binding documents that, that'll hold up in court. I'm in the plan on paying off auto loan requesting it be deleted it's hurting me to purchase a home so here's the thing a lot of people think removing their student loans or removing their car loans is going to help them buy a house and that's not true um it's not true at all actually when you are removing accounts from your credit you are not only just removing the derogatory part of the account but you're removing every piece of that account so all of the on-time payment history um the age, um, like you're, you're losing everything associated with these accounts. And so when you have that, what can happen is that it's going to alter your credit score. So whereas you thought it was going to shoot your credit score up, your credit score is going to drop because now your age of your credit has changed. The amount of on-time payment history, uh, the on-time payments that have been made in a certain amount of time, that is going to change. So many things are going to change because you're just flat out removing these accounts instead of just correcting the things that are incorrect. Um, so please, 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 please be very careful with removing things like your student loans and your car loans, um, especially things like that. Those are considered long-term loans, meaning there's more than two years worth of history associated with these accounts. And so you want to be very careful when removing them because, um, oh, thank you, Yvonne. I didn't even see that. Thank you for wishing me happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. Um, you just want to be very careful with removing these items because, again, if you do not have a good amount, uh, like a strong, solid credit profile without these accounts, um, then you run the risk of kind of trashing your account right before you go to buy a house. It's a joint account, and I do want it closed. If you want it closed, then close the account. Go for it. Do you work on people's credit? I do. It's hurting the... Shoot. It's hurting the report in every month late in this point. I don't care. I have over 16 year account history. That's not enough. Okay. When you are look considering closing accounts or when you're considering a decision that will affect your credit score, you need to understand how your credit score is calculated because you having 16 years worth of history means nothing when things only report for seven years. That, like that's very important that you understand that and then what is has been reporting for the last seven years is also important because if you weren't opening up um 
and paying off accounts during a specific time period that that gap can affect you as well once these old accounts aged off but it's very important and again everybody's case is situational so please analyze the entirety of your credit report before making a decision like this so on-time payment history that's 35 percent of your credit score how many on-time payments are you going to lose by removing this account um that's 35% of your score, like I said, 30% of your score is your credit card utilization. So out of the open credit cards that you have, um, what are the utiliz what's the utilization reporting at? I know a lot of research says 30%, but if you do not have a 750, then your credit utilization needs to be at 10% or less. The closer to, to 1%, the better, but it never needs to be at 0%. We've talked about that a lot. It should never be at 0%. You also want to look at your mix of accounts. And this is going for your open accounts, not even your closed accounts, but your open accounts. Um, a good, like the average consumer report for someone who has good credit, um, they have at least three credit cards, one short-term loan and one long-term loan reporting at all times. Um, do you have that without this account on it? You want to look at um, inquiries. How many inquiries do you have? I always tell people you the maximum you should have in a 12-month time period is five, right? So once you start getting closer to like eight, nine, ten in a 12-month time period, you're doing too much. You need to chill out. Um, but these are all things that when factored together, they create your credit score. So you want to take all of these things into consideration before making a decision of removing an account from your credit report. That's not a collection. Collections are just negative. Take that shit off. But when you when it comes to these original accounts, especially accounts that you paid on for a very long period of time, you just want to be very, very careful when removing them. Oh, thank you. Somebody else said happy birthday. My birthday was yesterday. Thank you, guys. Um, so if it only have a little over a year as far as dot dot, uh, as far as count, is it worth getting rid of? That's only something you can decide, right? That's not something I can decide for you because you have to take your entire credit report into account. A lot of people make these rash decisions just based off of this one account. This one account has late payments and I want it off. But you have to look at the bigger picture because that one account is just a Jenga piece in the, the, you know, the game that is the credit game, right? But removing the wrong piece can topple the entire board. So you have to be careful. What if you pay your car off? So I actually just did a video about this. I want to say it was on my birthday. Oh my God. Um, yesterday talking about paying your car off before you go house hunting and kind of why you should stay away with it, <laughs> stay away from it. And the reason why is because when you pay your car off, um, or whenever you pay off a loan, that account is then closed. Whenever an account is closed, this affects your credit score by dropping your credit score because you no longer have this item reporting every single month. So your credit score is going to go down. That's a given. Whenever, and this is when you pay off your student loans, when you pay off your car loans, your mortgage, whatever loan you have, or if you have a credit card that you close, your score is going to drop. So if you are paying your car off and then a month or two later, you're going to go buy a car, your score is going to go down. That's why I say, and then I always tell people anyway, when you're looking to buy a house, you shouldn't be making any major moves with your credit at least six months out. So anything you're going to do to your credit, you need to do it greater than six months out from you going to a lender and asking for a loan. And this is to make sure that whatever aftershocks are going to happen with your credit, it's already done. This is what your score is. Um... And there's not going to be any surprises. That's the biggest thing. A lot of people end up losing their homes because your credit score is one thing in the beginning of the process. And then by the time you get to closing, it's something completely different. You know, you don't want any surprises with your credit. So leading up to six months before you go to this lender to get this house, don't do anything to your credit. Leave it alone. My student loan has some late payments on it. I'm income-based repayment, though. I consolidated it later. So you can, um, hmm. So if it's old history tied to your student loans, there is a video on my YouTube channel. My YouTube is WWTMPD, What Would the Money Plug Do? Um, and there's a video on how to remove it. But again, practice discernment. Removing the student loan may not be in your best interest. So you just want to make sure that you weigh all of your options. But if you contact that the, the loan uh, person or the person who services your loan and you can't come, they don't have have a program where you can get those late payments updated to like paid as agreed or something like that or if they validate the fact that these were late so let's say you request a copy of your payment history and ask them to prove that you were late and they have proof um that considers it that's considered a valid late payment um 
if you can't get them to change it, removing it is the only way to get rid of it. But you also, like I said, need to understand the consequences with that. What do you do when they sue you? Go to court. If somebody is suing you, show up to court. The majority of these companies only win these lawsuits because y'all aren't showing up in court. The same way that you send these letters with your chest, you y'all be sending these letters with your chest out, certified, taking pictures, all that. That same energy you need to have in court. Even if you literally print your letters out and take them with you, the that you're gonna have that same energy in court. Force them to do a debt validation in the courtroom that day. And if they can't, then you won't owe and they can't report. I'm trying to get my utilization between three and 5%. That is the goal. That is a really good goal to have. How do you estimate the price for a pay to delete? So my rule of thumb is I always offer 20% of whatever the debt is, because I know if they don't agree, they're going to counter offer. It's usually going to be higher, but it may not be a hundred percent. So whether I'm settling or whether I'm negotiating a pay to delete, I always start at 20% of whatever the debt is. Can anyone garnish your checks when you are in the process of disputing the account? nor notify you of any garnishment. So let's talk about that because that ties into the comment about getting sued. So here's the thing. If you live at a different address from wherever the account um, originated from, so let's say, again, you lived in Kansas and you moved to North Carolina, and so they're sending all of the notifications of um, you owing and them trying to collect and things to Kansas. What's going to end up happening if they do not have an up-to-date contact uh, number, address, email address, or anything like that for you, is they can, in Kansas, they can file with their local court, like civil court, to take you to court for this debt. And because they attempted to contact you by sending these notifications to these old addresses, that classifies as an attempt to notify. And so you will still be expected to show up to these court dates, and then when you don't, they win due to something known as an order of default because you are not there to negate what they're saying. They're going to win and then they're going to enter a wage garnishment since you are not there to disclose your financial status. So that's that, that they've been doing that for a while. Now, the changes that were made to the FDCPA this past November made it harder for them to do that. There's more information they have to provide. They have to make um, larger strides in trying to contact you guys um, and things like that. However, um, Typically, what I tell people is if you know you owe somebody money in a state, um, check that state's court website. I don't know what it is for all these other states. I was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. And so for us, it's called Maryland Case Search. So if you search Maryland Case Search, if you click on Maryland Case Search when you go to Google it, right, um, and you search your name, it will show you any court cases in which your name appears. And so if you do have a court date for a debt that you owe, it is likely that you'll see it there. And it'll have when you're supposed to show up a um like a docket number and then you can call the court and ask them when am I supposed to show up and then just show up in court or ask them for an extension or telephonic hearing etc cetera, etc cetera. um do, 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 do. last year really hurt my credit with a shit ton of inquiries yeah you got to be very careful when it comes to inquiries they tell you guys all the time that when you apply for something within 30 days like of, and it's in the same industry it only hurts your score one time and while that is true um, what they don't tell you is that the inquiries are still listed on your credit and you can be denied for things regardless of what your score is. You can be denied for things just because you have too many inquiries in a 12 month time period. There are even some companies like Chase. Chase has the 524 rule. If you open up more than five credit cards in 24 months, Chase is going to deny you. So you got to be cognizant of things like that as well. Just because it doesn't affect your score doesn't mean it won't affect your chances on getting approved. Do you work on people's credit for them? Yes, I do. Is it better to pay off collections and ask for a pay to delete? You always want to ask for the pay to delete first. So typically when it comes to collections, first you want to force them to validate that debt. Um, and then, you know, if it's a valid debt, you'll pay. Now, how you force them to do the debt validation is completely on you. Some people will offer a pay to delete first and they'll say, hey, I pulled a copy of my credit and I'm noticing that you guys are reporting that I owe you a debt. I am not accepting ownership of this debt. However, I really need this item removed. So I'm willing to pay you X amount of dollars in exchange for you removing this item from my credit report. If you do not agree with this, uh, if you reject my offer, well, then I will request a debt validation. And if the debt is considered valid, then we will have a separate discussion. Um, 
But if you agree, please respond to this notification saying that not only that you agree with what I'm offering you, but you are also agreeing to remove the item from my consumer report uh, upon payment. You want to secure this in writing before paying because this is your proof that it needs to be deleted. So if you give them the 30 to 45 days that they tell you to give them to reflect the changes and it's still not done, you can take a copy of that letter and your proof of payment and send it to the credit bureaus yourself to get the item removed. If I have a loan that has one payment left, should I open a new account to take the place of this one? Um, some people do. So, for example, I do, um, depending on what it is. So, I had, uh, I always do self. I do self lender all the time. I do it for the 12 month option. I choose however much I want to save up, and then I pay it. And then, as soon as it's paid off, I open up another one. That's only because, um, a, like I told you, a good baseline, like the average person with good credit has at least three credit cards, one short-term loan and one long-term loan reporting at all times. So if something is coming off, let's say I close a credit card because I no longer find it valuable, then I'm going to make sure I have something to replace it with. I always tell people a really good analogy is that your consumer report is like a house that's in floodlands, right? And it's up on stilts. Every account that you add to your consumer report is another beam under the house. Now, if, you know, as the years go by, beams fall off, right? They break or whatever the case may be. Now, if you do not replace those beams, now your house is not stable. And if you don't have enough beams supporting your house, your house is going to fall, you're going to drown. So that's a really good analogy that I use to explain to people, like, why you add new accounts to your consumer report over time and, and kind of how it works when a consumer report falls off. Well, I mean, I'm sorry, when a trade line falls off your consumer report. Um, hold on. TikTok keeps refreshing the comments, so I have to scroll up. And then I'm also checking Facebook. Oh, thank you. Somebody said happy birthday. Thank you. Um, so I'm also checking like eight different, I'm live on a couple of different platforms. So just give me a second. Um, let's see. Um, what's your YouTube again? The name of my YouTube channel is WWTMPD. What would the money plug do? That is the name of my YouTube channel. How can I contact you? Do you work on people's credit for them? Yes. If you're on TikTok, you can click the link in my bio that takes you to my website. And there's a couple different buttons you can take a look at. Um, and if you are interested in credit repair services, you can click on become a client. And it outlines the process, the prices, as well as there's a web form that you will have to fill out in order to have an appointment. Um, uh, property rep I took my car to get fixed, but never went back for it. So he kept it for parts. So the car was not properly repossessed. So the account is still open and reporting late. That is legal. That is completely legal because that had nothing to do with the servicer. When you have that vehicle, you are responsible for whatever happens to it. So if, if it's towed because you parked it somewhere else, you weren't somewhere you weren't supposed to, and they keep it because you don't have the money to get it out, you are still obligated to make those payments. So technically, you are still on the hook for that loan. Yes, one short term and one long term loan. So a short term loan is an installment loan with a term length of 24 months or less, something you're going to be paying off fairly quickly. These are usually like furniture leasing, um, you know, things like a firm. If you guys use a firm, they report to your credit. <laughs> um, let's see what else. Um, self, this is classified as um, the credit builder loan that's considered a short term loan. Um, long term loans are things like your student loans, mortgages, car loans, things like that. My car was repoed in December and was 27 k underwater. What are my payoff options? Um, whoa. So they sold it and you still owe 27000 What kind of car was you driving? Jesus. Um, so you have a couple options. Um, you can try to settle for less than owed if you just don't have that in you. Um, and usually what they, they're going to require, I always tell people, do not start negotiating settlements and stuff until you actually have the money. Because what they're going to okay now is not what they're going to okay later. So you always, if you're looking to settle for less than old, at least make sure you have the amount that you are offering on hand so that as soon as they agree, you can go ahead and pay it. Even if it, you know, a lot of people be like, oh, you shouldn't settle for less than old. Listen, you got to get these balances down to zero. You got to do what you got to do. While I am a credit repair specialist, I'm also a realist. And I understand that if I had $27,000, I would have paid the damn car off when I had it. So you, you get what I'm saying? So settling for less than old is an option. What I will tell you is that when you do settle, 
and you settle and it's the amount that's forgiven is $600 or more, you're going to receive something in the mail known as a 1099C. This is required for you to file on your taxes. That is because the amount that is forgiven is now considered income since you did not pay it out. So it's now considered income and it must be filed with your taxes. That's very important for you guys to understand for those of you who are settling debt. Um, but yeah, when you guys are planning on buying homes and things like that and you have repos, you need to get those balances down to zero. So whether they make you pay in full and so you enter into a payment arrangement or you go ahead and settle for less than owed, but you need to get that balance down to zero. On Credit Sesame, my credit shows one thing and my credit drop, but on my Experian TransUnion Equifax, it's probably something different. Okay, and the reason why is because you are looking at completely different scoring models. Credit Sesame looks at your Vantage scores, um, which is not incorrect. It's just that depending on what you're applying for, that's not what they're going to see. You're going to want to track your FICO scores, which is what you'll typically see with these free accounts with like Experian and stuff like that. You'll see your FICO score. And even with FICO, there are multiple FICO scores. There's your FICO 8 and your FICO 9. There's your FICO mortgage scores, which is your 2, 4, and 5. There's your FICO credit card score, your FICO auto score. There's so many different scores out there because remember we also talked about the FICO 10 and FICO 10T. Um, so just make sure that you're doing your due diligence. If you know you're looking to buy, uh, if you know you want a credit card, let's say you want a Capital One account, and um, let's say they tell you, hey, we check Experian, then you'll check your Experian to see, oh my God, I zoomed in way too much. <laughs> you'll check your Experian FICO credit card score um, because that is likely what they'll see when they pull your score, which is typically your FICO 8. Don't trust Vantage. Some companies still use Vantage. I ain't even going to hold you. Um... Like, some companies use Vantage. I was kind of shocked about that. But, yeah, some of them still out there. Do you have credit repair classes? I'm an upcoming credit repair specialist. Everybody keeps asking me, y'all, and I swear I keep thinking about it. I'll start it, then stop it, start it, then stop it. I don't offer any classes right now, but I do do something once a quarter, and it's called... um. It's called a tea. It's called my tea party. So normally when I go live, it'll be called like the tea on credit repair or the tea on evictions or something like that. And so um, once a quarter, I do something known as a tea party. And this is when other credit repair organizations can come. We get on Zoom. Um, we sit, we talk, we eat, whatever, whatever questions you guys have as far as like how I run my business or like the knowledge and stuff that I have, how I get media exposure and things like that. Like I'll, you know, I sit and disclose that with you all. Um. Let's see. What other questions? And don't think I'm ignoring y'all. I'm getting to all the questions. It just takes me a while. Like I said, I'm going through Facebook. I'm going through YouTube. What was the lady um, name on TikTok for homes? Her name is the.mortgage.mentor. If you're in the Facebook group, her name is Rebecca Richardson. Um, but on TikTok and Instagram, her name is the.mortgage.mentor. No, it hasn't sold yet, but will be about 17K after sale, maybe. Damn. I surrendered the car over eight years, no longer on my credit, yet they just started calling me to pay it off. That's because, so, okay, so Lynn, when it comes to how long something reports on your credit, it's seven years from the date of first delinquency. And so if it's off your credit, that means the reporting time has passed. However, you need to identify what your state laws are. So certain states have it to where they can sue you longer than the debt will report. For example, like Rhode Island. Rhode Island statute of limitations is 10 years. Even though it's only can report on your credit for seven, they have an additional three years where the company can go back and sue you if you don't pay. Now, me personally, I'm not responding to none of that shit. Um, cause you should have hollered at me when it was on my credit. Um, so if you do your research for your state and you see that they cannot sue you, I'm not even talking to you as the money plug no more. I'm talking to you as Marquia. I'm not fucking paying it. That's just where, you know, that's above me now. Um, <laughs> Cause you can't make me pay it now. Should I file bankruptcy regarding the car? It's 18 K owed. And thank you. Um, unfortunately I do not advise on bankruptcies. So I can tell you how to remove a bankruptcy. If you file bankruptcy, I can help you remove the account if you choose not to file bankruptcy, but I do not advise as to whether or not that is a good option for you because I am not a bankruptcy lawyer. I highly suggest you speak to a bankruptcy lawyer so that they can explain to you kind of like, um, the pros and cons of filing for bankruptcy just in general, especially looking at your specific credit report. What app is best to check your credit? This is different depending on who you ask and what you're looking for. I always tell people, identify what your goal is first. So if your goal is a house, you're going to want to check your FICO 2, 4, and 5. If you want to check your FICO 2, 4, and 5, I suggest the My FICO app. 
M Y F I C O. Um, they have a website, myfico.com. Um, and it's a little on the high side when it comes to like how much you pay for credit monitoring, but it's worth it because I can track my specific mortgage scores, my mortgage scores specifically. Right. And then once a quarter, I get a report, but I don't use it for that. Um, now, for uh, for me, I have two subscriptions. So I have my FICO and then I have smart credit. I use smart credit because it makes it easier for me to identify items and the validity of these items. So it allows me to kind of look at everything. And I'm like, okay, so everything's the same across the board for balances. Wait, these days are like 60 days apart. I can use this to dispute. It just makes it easier for me to look at. Um, I'm all about working smarter, not harder. And so I do pay for those two, excuse me, subscriptions. But strictly smart credit, I look at it for the report. My FICO, I look at for my credit scores. Um, do, 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 do. Hello. Hello. What should you do if it's past the statute of limitations? Not a motherfucking thing. Do you hear me? You leave it exactly where it's at. It is between them and God. Once the statute of limitations pass, this company cannot sue you legally for that debt. So you don't have to pay. Now, some, for some states like Texas, right? So Texas statute of limitations is four years. Now, the, obviously, that's less than seven years. So once the statute of limitations pass, they legally can still report. Um, so, you know, I just wouldn't touch it. But, you know, once they can't and it's off my credit, oh, girl, I'm not paying that. Hold on, huh? A 1099C. Yes. So a 1099C has to be issued when you have debt that had greater than $600 that has been forgiven. It is now considered income for the amount that was forgiven and it needs to be filed with your income. It needs to be filed with your taxes because I can guarantee you the business counted it as income, uh, counted it on their taxes. So you need to make sure you count it on yours so you're not audited later on. Damn, Louisiana. Yeah, I'm sorry. If you in Louisiana, that's 10 years. Whew. My car loan was 14K. It was stolen, went into a charge off account. The car was auctioned. Do I owe the full amount? So what's going to happen is if you owed 14K, they sold the car. Whatever they sold the car for should be deducted from that 14K. And then the amount that's left over, that is the amount that you now owe. That's crazy. Oh, I hate states like that. Let's see. Let's see. All right, y'all. I'm still refreshing these comments. I'm trying to get down to the bottom. I'm trying so hard. Okay. Okay. I think I am at the bottom. All right. Let's check this. Let's check this. Okay. Good. All right. What other questions y'all got? Whew. My son is eight. My son, 18, has a credit card. I'm trying to get him a short-term loan. What do you recommend? I recommend self. Um, I love self's credit builder loan. Um, the reason why is because even though it reports as if you're paying back a loan, you pick how much you want to pay and for how long up to two years. That's why I do the one year option. Um, even you pay into it every month and it reports as if you're paying back a loan. However, at the end of the life of that loan, so that once you pay it off, you get a direct deposit or a check in the amount that you paid into it because you are actually paying into a certificate of deposit. And so once it's paid off, you get all your money back. Is there a way to find out how much it was sold for? It happened in Cali and I'm in Pennsylvania. You'll have to reach out to that company. So you'll say, hey, I pulled a copy of my credit report and I'm noticing that the vehicle that you all are saying was repossessed was sold and I was never notified. Um, legal, you know, per state law, whatever your state law is, you are required to disclose where the car was sold, how much the car was sold for, and what the remaining balance is uh, for this vehicle. And I have not received any of this information. Please cease all attempts to collect as well as reporting uh, attempts until this matter is rectified. How can I get a timeshare removed? Um, short answer, if you can identify an inaccuracy in how it is reporting, you can use that to get it removed. But with timeshare specifically, if you can identify like a law that they break with this timeshare, so like um, in different states, um, you need to check your state laws because some states actually have laws against timeshares, like what they can and can't do, like in the presentations and stuff like that. Um, but definitely comb through your laws to see if you can use maybe the legality of the timeshare itself to have the account removed from your credit report. For example, so, you know, a lot of people remember at the beginning of like last year, everybody was talking about cushion accounts, right? There was these companies, these jewelry stores that would give you a line of credit and they would report it. Now, 
I even did it. I used to have something called Harris Jewelers. I did this back in 2010. And I would just buy a piece of jewelry every year or so just to keep the account open because it helped with my credit utilization. And so some people wasn't paying on time, missed some payments, did just stopped making payments completely. They all got together and did a class action lawsuit because of how these items were reporting and some of the things that, you know, the companies did that, you know, had the legality looking a little shaky. And in doing so, they actually got them removed. These companies no longer even report to the bureaus at all. So you never know what you can do if you know what you're talking about. I'm trying to get my credit score to go up. Should I pay off the balance all off in one month or pay a few hundred every month? So when it comes to credit cards and how to pay your credit cards, right? So I, I know I'm going to get some kickback because I always do when I have this conversation. When it comes to credit cards, number one, you need to call. Now, and you're going to have to do this for each credit card that you have. For each credit card that you have, you need to identify your billing cycle. So what is your billing cycle? Is it from the 1st to the 27th? Is it from the 1st to the 30th? You need to identify your billing cycle because at the end of your billing cycle, that is when you usually get the notification like, oh, hey, your monthly statement is now available. Click here to view it. This is when they go to the credit bureaus and tell them, yo, by the way, they using this much money out of the money that I told them they could spend. That's when they report your credit utilization. Credit utilization is 30% of your credit score. This needs to be as low as possible without touching zero. Do not pay the card all the way off right away. Now, before the end of your billing cycle for that card, you're going to want to pay your balance down to as low as possible. A lot of people do research and it says like, oh, 30%, 30%, 30%. But if you don't have a 750, it needs to be even less than that. If you do not have a 750, your credit utilization overall not even just per card. When you add up all of the um, total available credit for all of your credit cards, it needs to report at less than 10% to maximize the points you're getting from this section. So if you put in your payment for each card before the statement date, and I always tell people five business days before the end of your billing cycle because you want to make sure that not only you submitted a payment, but that the payment has cleared prior to your statement, your monthly statement being drawn up. Now, once your monthly statement is drawn up, then you can pay the card off the rest of the way if you're one of those people who just want to pay their card off every month. Me, I leave a small balance on my card. Usually it's like 5 to $10.00. I guess, maybe a little bit more. Um, but I always leave a balance on my credit cards. And the reason why is because I allow these companies, certain companies to charge me interest, right? It's not for every single card, but I allow certain companies to charge me interest because I'm trying to build on the relationship that we have. Now, I did a video on, and I got a lot of kickback, but it actually makes sense, right? And the analogy that I use is, for those of you who did not go to college, you know, I, I was in the military, so I didn't go to college. A lot of us don't go to college, but we get out of the military and we're able to work in our fields. And the reason why is because of network. Right. The military has allowed us to network and get things that having a degree can't. So if you have a credit score and your credit score just doesn't measure up, right? Like you just don't have the best score. Normally they would not deal with people with this credit score, but you have an amazing relationship with this bank. They're making good money off of you. Listen, they're getting into you. You pay them interest. So they're getting even more money outside of the merchant fees and things like that. When you allow them to make more money off of you, you are considered considered a valued client. When you're considered a valued client, they're willing to make certain concessions in order to get you certain things. And so me paying interest is kind of me building on the relationship that I have with those companies. But again, it all depends on how what you're willing to do. This is, again, discernment. So every tip that I give may not apply to your situation, but you know, if it sounds like something you're interested in, that's what I do. Um, do, 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 do. Let me... Um, do you offer credit repair classes for upcoming credit repair specialists? I do not, not currently. If you miss a payment by one day, will it still be considered late? Yes, but it won't be reported to the credit bureaus. They cannot report late payments to the credit bureaus unless you are more than 30 days late. So on that 31st day, they're going to report it. However, the company can still assess a late fee if it is in their policy that if you are late a day, you know, so if it's in their policy that one day late, you're going to get a fee, you're going to get that fee, but they can't report it to the credit bureaus. What is the difference between your individual and couple audit? Um, I'm either doing a credit audit for one person or for a couple. That's the difference. Literally. That's the only difference. So if you are a married couple, um, and you guys are looking to buy a home together, it's best for me to sit down and look at your credit together so that I can tell both of you exactly what needs to be done in order for both of your names to be included on that loan and you get approved. Does that make sense? 
And I know I keep looking away, y'all. I swear ain't nothing wrong with me. Um, I'm live on like 80 different things. If you paid an account off, what kind of letter should you send to have it removed? So here's the thing. If you've already paid off an account, removing it is going to be hard because you already paid the account. So there's no incentive for that company to remove it. If it's an item that was in collections, you can always just ask them to remove it. Some companies, their policy is once an account is paid in full, um, it can be removed. A lot of times they're not going to do it unless you ask. Um, now, if that doesn't work, what you can, uh, and it's with the original creditor, maybe it's not a collection, maybe it's a charge off. What you can do is you can request a copy of your payment history, right? And then you can use that copy of your payment history and try to dispute something um, to just kind of bring in the validity of the debt into question right and then use that to get a removal but again when you remember we just talked about it when you're removing accounts that are still with the original creditor right when you're removing all that history associated with that account that can be more of a detriment than a benefit so just be very very careful um but always ask first right because you you know you never know what they'll tell you but if they tell you no you would just dispute it like you would dispute anything else that's my situation now i was on auto pay on one of my cars and it went 30 days late because for some reason it wasn't on auto pay. Yes. And what they will tell you is that that is not their fault because you are supposed to make sure that all of these things are set up every month. I can tell you that now. They're going to tell you that. Even with closed accounts. Yeah, you could dispute a closed account. But as long as something is reported on your credit, whether it's open or closed, that history is helping your credit. So if you remove a closed account, it's still going to affect your credit. It's going to affect the age. It's going to affect the on-time payments, all of that. If, if you can see it on your credit report, taking it off might hurt you better than it can help you, more than it can help you with everything except collections, literally everything except collections. Whether it's, char whether it's paid off or not doesn't make a difference. What other questions y'all got for me? Now is the time to ask. I'm actually in a really good mood and I'm not even sleepy. So I might stay on for another hour. But it wasn't in good standing. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Um, if you've ever made any on-time payments, if the account was open longer than a day, um, it could affect your score negatively. Because again, so the analogy that I use to kind of get people to envision it, um, you got to look at your credit report as a house, right? It's a house that's in floodlands. Whenever you got a house that's in floodlands, it's usually kind of up on stilts or something like that. Like there, it's up, it's elevated. All of the accounts that you're adding to your credit profile, are you adding stilts to the bottom of your house? The more poles you have down there, the more sturdy your house is in the event that one washes away. Because remember, when you pay loans off, they only report for seven years from that last payment. And after that, they fall off your credit report. So when it falls off, what happens? You lose all the history associated with it. But if you don't have enough poles up under your house, when one washes away, what happens? The whole thing can just topple down. So you have to make sure that you you, you have a solid credit profile for those of y'all who just wanting to just snatch shit off of it. Exactly. Half of the time, I don't delete my client's student loans. Yeah, and I, I tell that, no, don't get me wrong, I'll tell you how to take something off, but I'm also one of those people who are going to tell you the pros and the cons of doing so because there is a consequence for every action. A lot of people are so hyper-focused on, I want it off, I want it off, I want it off, because... TikTok and the rest of society will have you believe that a squeaky clean credit score is what you'll need. You don't need a squeaky clean credit score. You just need a strong, healthy credit score. Hey, girl. Oh, text me, too. My phone will do not disturb because I'm live on Instagram. But text me, T. What you doing next weekend? What other questions you guys got? I love answering your questions. Oh, hey, Kiara. What, what question? You got some questions? I'm mad I didn't go live right away on Instagram, but I am live in my Facebook group, and I'm live on TikTok, and I'm live on YouTube. So for those of you who are new here, I'm sorry, I never introduced myself. Welcome. My name is Markia. I'm known as the Money Plug here on social media. I'm a board-certified credit score consultant and a board-certified credit repair specialist. I am also certified in the FDCPA, which is the Deferred Debt Collection Practices Act, and the FCRA, which is the um, Fair Credit Reporting Act. I use my platform to educate black communities and other underserved communities on the importance of credit and things like that. Um, 
And so once a week, I try to go live with you guys, answer all the questions I can. I post a lot of credit related content. Um, TikTok doesn't allow me to save my lives and Instagram be hating. So sometimes I can't save it there either. So I started going live on YouTube. So all of my videos um, when I go live like this are available. So you guys can watch them. If you came late, uh, left early or anything like that, you can always go to my YouTube channel and watch them. My YouTube channel is WWTMPD. What would the money plug do? Thank you, Lisa. I'm trying to gain business credit so I don't have to buy all my own inventory. So let's talk about that for a second since you're here. So I'm currently going through training. Y'all know on Thursdays, I don't work. <laughs> on Thursdays, I do like, it's like um, professional development. And so I'm currently going through training to get certified in business credit. So yay. But um, the biggest thing I can tell y'all is that the lie that, oh, don't be trying to talk. My, I know my, oh, my sister. So y'all know, <laughs> She had to call me like that. Don't first of all, mm, don't do me because I put agave in my tea, so it's not sugar. It's agave in my tea. But all right, this is my only Pepsi. I'm only allowed to have one a day. Don't do me. Anyway, tattletale. Like next thing I know, my mother gonna pop up on Instagram and tell me put it down. Watch. Anyway. For business credit, right, you don't have to have good personal credit to build business credit. And I know a lot of people think that, and so they kind of hold off on starting their business, but that's not entirely true. Um, it is going to take you longer to establish business credit, but you can do it without having good personal credit. The, the, the biggest thing that you need to know is net 30, net 60, and net 90 accounts. So for those of you who are entrepreneurs and you're looking to stop spending your pocket money on your inventory, you're going to want to start off with those accounts. I always tell people start off with Quill, Uline, um, Amazon, Amazon Business. You got to order a couple things. Like I placed a couple orders for at least $100 before I got the option to do like the net 30, 60, 90s or whatever. But um, not always slandy. And here's why when you start off with these smaller accounts, you can't jump out there going straight to the bank and trying to get a credit card in your business name. There are certain steps you need to make. So number one, you need to make sure that you're right. You know, you have your EIN and your DUNS number. That's super important. The DUNS number, right? And it's free to get a lot of y'all be paying people to do this for you. And this stuff is completely free. So you're going to want to get your EIN and your DUNS number. You're also going to want to register, maybe like get like, a. A lot of people use like iPostal or something like that to get like a business address and then get a business and make sure you have a business bank account. That's also important. Um, and get a lot of people say that signing up for 411 or something like that will help. I never did it and I have a business credit score. Um, but to each his own, if you feel like that'll help you do it. But I had, I started off with Quill, Uline, Shirtsy. Um, and I got a gas card. None of these companies asked for my personal social security number. None of these companies asked for my personal social security number. And I was rocking with these accounts. Um, I was rocking with these accounts for about like three or four months before I started qualifying for credit cards. I started with a secured credit card with Bank of America and it kind of worked my way up from there. Okay, so I have two out of three. What's a Dunn's account? So if you go to Dunn, D-N-B, so the letters D-N-B dot com, it's Dunn and Bradstreet. These are one of the people who report business credit. Um, they report business credit and generate a score for you. You go to their website and you fill out the information. It's completely free. You fill out the information. Um, they'll be like, oh, we'll give you a DUNS number in like 30 days. And then they'll, you know, they'll send you an email letting you know when it's done. Um, but when you get these other net 30, 60, 90 accounts and they start reporting, you want to make sure that they report to Dun & Bradstreet specifically because the quickest way to get a credit score. Them and Experian, I, I believe. Spell it again, please. Uh, D-N-B, literally, the letters D-N-B, Delta November Bravo dot com, right? D-N-B dot com. Mm -mm -mm. Yep, D-N-B dot com. And then you'll go down, you'll go to Dunn's number. It's real big up at the top, and it says get a Dunn's number. And it's going to walk you through the steps. It's completely free. And then you're going to start. And I always tell people, start with accounts that you're actually going to spend money on. Don't, you know, I heard Dunn's was going away, but it's not yet. That's another thing. Um, that's another thing. Y'all got to stop. Just because you hear it's going away or because I know somebody, I've been getting like an influx of questions asking me like, yo, um, they're getting rid of credit scores. So. Uh, or they're getting rid of the credit bureaus, so I don't need to know nothing about this. This doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. Until they officially get rid of it, it applies to you. I didn't even see this question. I'm so sorry. So what credit score do you need to apply for a Navy Federal credit card? I'm going to be honest. 
I, with Navy Federal, if you get an account with them, they're going to give you a credit card. <laughs> like, I, it's very rare that you get denied. Navy Federal just be throwing money at people. But that's not, and it's not just Navy Federal. It's a lot of, um, it's a lot of with credit unions. It's easier for you to get things because you're not just a number, right? You, you, you mean a lot more to a lot of these companies. So don't start off with the Bank of America's. Don't start off with the Wells Fargo. Look at MeQ and CQ. So, okay. So let's talk about it. If you are somebody who applies for credit cards and things like that, and you are constantly getting denied, let me ask you something. Are you reading your denial letters? A lot of people, when y'all get denied for something, you got to add it to you. And so then when they send you the denial letter or they show it to you in the app, or um, if they mail it to you, you just throw it in the trash. You throw it in the trash because you got to add it to you because you got denied. Um, so... What you don't understand is that legally, whenever you are denied for something, if you're denied a job, if you're denied insurance, or if you're denied like things like loans and credit cards, anything that you apply for that they have to look at your consumer report, um, whenever you're denied, they have to send you a letter telling you exactly what got you denied. And what a lot of y'all don't realize is this shit is the cheat code. Because if you fix everything that they have listed as holding you back, then you get the, you get the account. It's not just your score isn't good enough. That's not what the letter say. I can promise you that is not all that that letter says. It'll actually tell you exactly what on the account is affecting your score so that you, I'm sorry, if you, okay, let me ask you this. Are you sitting around a 650 on FICO or on Vantage? Because if you're sitting around a 650 on FICO and you don't qualify for any Navy federal accounts, you're definitely going to want to take um, a closer look at your credit. For sure. Definitely with the attitude. <laughs> um, what gas card did you get? So uh, I just got a look. I've got a local gas card. It's Wex. I think W E X. Um, that's not okay. So no, what FICO scores? So again, FICO has multiple. I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to your question. Um, FICO has multiple scores. So FICO has your FICO base score. There's your FICO 8 base score, your FICO 9 base score. There's your FICO mortgage scores, your FICO credit card scores, your FICO auto scores. You're going to want to look at the, the, you know, Navy Federal offers different cards. Look at the gold card that you're trying to apply for, right? The one card you're trying to apply for. Do your research. See exactly what score they check. Then you go to your FICO, you're my FICO, and you look at that score specifically. And then read your denial letter again because under where it says what your score is and what their goal score is, it's going to have a, like specific things that says like, oh, you uh, unpaid balances are high or too many inquiries in a 12-month time period, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They literally have to list everything that's affecting your score and keeping you from qualifying for that account. Use that to fix your credit yourself and you can qualify for things. Now, let's say you apply for something and you really feel like you should have gotten that. Like you really feel like they're wrong and you're right. They already charged you. They're, they already charged you the inquiry. So what you do is you contact them, you call them and you say, Hey, um, I want to speak to somebody about a redetermination. A redetermination means they take a closer look at your credit profile to make sure that the system, the system didn't make a mistake. You have to understand that these are automated systems that are kind of going through your account at lightning speed, right? For And it's not always correct, right? It's not always that efficient. So you want to force them to take a closer look at your credit score, your credit report, because you might qualify for it. Just because your score don't hit the mark exactly doesn't mean that your credit profile isn't strong enough to stand on its own. So definitely whenever you apply for something and you deny it, they already charged you the inquiry. So get a redetermination. Now back to the gas card question. So I got WEX um, and I think that was good for like Wawa. I think I could only, I think they only offered me why, why, I think I was the only one in my area, but like Chevron has it. If you have a pilot near you, BP gas card, you know, um, but the gas card definitely was the biggest help with generating my business credit score. I'm working for a company that works with credit for companies and businesses. And this is a thousand percent true. Yay. What's Getsy? I've never heard of that. How does Amex report utilization for cards without predefined limits? Ooh, good question. So it's not even just Amex. So there are cards known as, um, what are they called? Prepaid credit cards. These cards will report on-time payment history, but what it won't report is balances. Um, now, this benefits a lot of y'all because for a lot of y'all, credit utilization ain't your strongest suit. Um, but um, for the most part, most cards that are like that, that don't have a predefined limit. So the Chime card, um, 
I'm talking about regular cards because not everybody qualify for Emacs. Um, but you know, <laughs> um, let's see, Chime, the extra card, Credit Sesame. Um, there's a cut. There's a lot of cards that will not report your utilization, but they'll report the on-time payment history for that card. Does that make sense? Mm -mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> What other questions y'all got for me? I just want y'all to know that my line sister <laughs> has been on my neck. So for those of y'all who don't know, um, if you follow me on, if you've been following me on TikTok for a while, you know, but, um, I was diagnosed with prediabetes, right? So I gotta be real careful with what I eat. This lady be texting me every day. Y'all text me or call me what you eat what you eat and then if, if it's something that i'm not supposed to eat she be making me feel so bad so whenever i see her name pop up in my phone i instantly get scared like you know how like when you go home from school at the like acting up and you're like damn i wonder did my teacher really call her that's how i be feeling when her name pop up on my phone i'll be like shit what did i eat today what did i eat today all right i'm good i be scared to open her messages i love how you go into detail with what you talk about oh i mean i feel like it's the only way people gonna understand it it's not enough to just like you know spit stats and stuff like that Girl, Tashera, it's only one Pepsi, and it's a can at that. It's not even a bottle. And I, look, it's still, like, full. Uline, Quill, what was the other one? Shirtsy. Shirtsy, because um, my very first company that I ever started, I was doing T-shirt designing, um, and so I would get my T-shirts and stuff from there. Amazon does net 30, 60, 90s. Um, who else? Sam's Club is a good one, as long as you got all your, like, paperwork and stuff in a row. I'm telling mommy, bye. You better not. You better not. You tattletale. Now, why is my mother calling and cuss me out? Thanks a lot. Um, you're a great teacher. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. What's another one? Floor and Decor, Home Depot. Um, but listen, get credit cards you're actually going to use when you're starting out. Because you using them is what's going to generate that history. Um, so, like, for me, I be using... Let me tell y'all something. Let me put y'all on right quick. So, I, y'all know I got a bunch of kids, right? For those of y'all who don't know, I got five kids. And so I use um, Uline, and I buy my laundry detergent off of there. I buy laundry detergent, Kleenex. I also homeschool my kids, so I'll buy, like, pencils, pens, highlighters, posters, poster boards, um, like, you know, school supplies. Listen, I'll be buying all kinds of office supplies. Like, girl, they, they be selling Alexas on there. Um, like, I buy everything on Uline. The more you use these accounts, you know, the more they're going to have to report to the credit bureaus. And I mean, I was put, I put orders in every month, every month, and then don't pay it off right away. Um, pay it off 16 days after you place your order. Yeah. 16 days or more after you pay your order, after you place your order. What sorority are you in? So I'm in a military sorority. I just crossed February 26th. It's not um, a D9. It's not in the Pan-Hellenic um, Conference. It's a military sorority. It's called Kappa Epsilon Psi. So much information. Listen, for those of you who want to be credit repair specialists, please do not be discouraged. Please do not be discouraged. The reason that I'm so knowledgeable is because, you know, <laughs> the reason I'm so knowledgeable is because I'm surrounded by it every day. The more you expose yourself to something, the more you realize. You got to think about it like this, right? When we used to memorize the lyrics to songs by playing the songs over and over and over and over and over, that's how you do it. I'm literally... I, when I tell y'all my husband be so tired of me, I'm literally in here reading these, um, going through the CFPB bulletins um, and stuff like that. Like, I'm, I be in here immersing myself in this stuff. That's how I memorize it. What is Uline? So Uline is a company that um, you, you, you can place orders with them for, like, packaging, um, all kinds of stuff if you own a business, and it'll help you build business credit. Like, you can buy boxes, jars, little shopping bags, um, I used to buy my, my little clear liners that I would put my t-shirts in before I wrap them up and put them in poly mailers. I would put them in these like little plastic, these little clear liners, um, to protect them. Yup. Granger as well. Yep. But your initial accounts should be accounts you're actually going to use. What is CFB? So the CFPB is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This is one of the entities that is in charge of enforcing the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, the FTC is like, look, girl, we... We don't got time for this. We need somebody who can do it. And that's kind of how the CFPB came about. 
And they're responsible for making sure that, you know, ser- loan servicers, credit card companies and stuff like that are abiding by the rules. Should I leave a balance on my credit card for a high credit score? It depends on... Uh, how do I say this without saying that? <laughs> so here's the thing. It's all about when you pay your credit card, not necessarily what you're asking. So for what I mean by that is, and we talked about it a little earlier for those of you who are in here, um, when it comes to your credit cards, if you pay your balance down to less than 10% before the end of your billing cycle, then after your statement date, you can pay the card off. That's up to you. Or you can leave a balance. I typically leave a balance depending on the credit card it is. But it's completely up to you. But by paying your cards down early, just earlier. So instead of paying it off on your due date, you're going to be paying it like 20 days before that, right? So by paying your balance down earlier, when they go to report to the credit bureaus, they're reporting lower utilization, which means you're maximizing the amount of points you get from that section. Credit card utilization is 30% of your credit score. So the lower that is without touching zero, the be- the more points you get. Thank you for the roses. Uh, do, 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 do. Can you get business credit while in a chapter 13? Um, yes, because technically your social and things like that are not being tied to these accounts. Your business is. So as long as your business is not like a sole proprietorship, I feel like a chapter 13 should not affect you. What do you think of Credit Karma suggested cards? I don't think you should be using Credit Karma to determine whether or not you qualify for something. Now, for some people, it may be accurate. And then for a lot of people, a lot of people, it ain't. Um, I always tell people, do your own research, pull up your FICO scores. Look at the, I always tell people when you're thinking about adding new credit cards to your profile, don't just start applying for shit because you see it in these credit repair groups. Cause that irritates me. Stop doing that. Just because such and such got 10,000, just because such and such got 25 K does not mean you need to apply for it. You need to sit down with yourself and first you need to identify your spending habits. You need to see what do I spend my money on the most? Um, I always tell people, print out a 30-day summary of your spending. So print out one of your bank statements. What are you spending your money on the most? Then you're going to want to sit and say, okay, so am I a cash back kind of girl? Am I a miles girl? Am I a points girl? And then you want to sit down, you want to look at those things, and you want to come up with credit cards that you feel will benefit you the most. So if you spend all your money on gas because you have a long commute um, and and you love cash back, then you're going to want a card that provides cash back for your gas because that's what you spend the most money on. Each credit card should have an assigned purpose to make sure that you're actually going to use it because remember a credit card is only valuable for as long as you're using it when you're no longer using a credit card then that's when you need to be if you have no purpose for this card don't just leave it sitting open on your credit report because if you're not using it eventually it can be closed due to inactivity if it's closed due to inactivity your score is going to go down um and you're not going to be prepared for it as opposed to if you close it yourself, you know the drop is coming and you can, you know, bounce back from there. But you don't want them closing it without, you know, oh my God, I wasn't ready because that affects your credit utilization. That also affects um, how many revolving accounts you have reporting in a month um, and things like that. Secure card advice. Treat your secured cards like you would treat any card. Any credit card. The only difference, and I hate that people really be making it seem like unsecured cards are better than secured cards. A, car, a credit card is a credit card is a credit card. The only difference between a secured and an unsecured is that secured cards tend to have lower balances because you have to put down a deposit in order to qualify for these cards. But if all you qualify for right now is secured cards, then you got to do what you got to do. Get that secured card, hold it, use it properly until you qualify for unsecured cards. I use smart credit, but credit karma is always exactly right. Then that's fine. Then you can use it. it sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. I mean... What other, oh shoot, I didn't check this. I didn't check Facebook. Listen, you know your stuff. I love it. (laughs) Thank you. And for those of y'all who are in the Facebook group, I know normally it doesn't look like this. Um, And I think I'm going to start doing it like this more. So normally when I go live, it's on my Facebook page and then I'll share it into the Facebook group. Um, And I think I'll continue to do that for Friday lives. But I think the regular ones during the week, I'm just going to keep them in-house. You know, we, we're trying to grow the community. The more people we have in the Facebook group, the more questions we get. Questions you may not even know that you had. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm hoping for. So I'm going to start saving these solely in the group. Just a heads up, she hates credit cards. Okay, but I'm, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I didn't tell us to get off of it. I just said, you know, for some people it's correct. And for other people, you might want to do your own research. Don't do me. 
<laughs> Listen, because it was a point in time I was cussing people out for using Credit Karma. I've matured. <laughs> I've matured. <laughs> what other questions you guys got? Look, is my sister going? Somebody tell me is my sister going? Because I want to drink this Pepsi, but if she's still watching me. LOL, I'm off it. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> Listen, because, listen, the majority of the stuff y'all applying for is not looking at your Vantage score, I promise. But let me tell y'all, this agave don't taste like nothing. That's the only thing. Like, when I drink tea, I be wanting sweet, like, sweet tea. It, I mean, but it's, it tastes better than that damn, than this. I was using Truvia. Shit's gross. What's your Facebook group? The name of the Facebook group is Plugged In The Credit Clubhouse. Or if you search the Money Plug Comma LLC on Facebook, um, my face will pop up. Um, and if you go to groups, you'll see the group under there. And then once I get, you, there's two groups. Y'all can send a, re if you're an entrepreneur, I highly suggest you send a request to the other group too. Because once I finish this business credit certification, I'm really going to be using that group um, to kind of show you guys and kind of give tips on business credit specifically. Because a lot of people just don't want to have to go through all of my content to find it. So I'm going to be putting it separately. How long does it take to get increase off your report after you submit letters? So that depends. So um, what I've been seeing lately is when you petition the credit bureaus, they'll respond and say, listen, we're only reporting what they tell us to. You're going to have to go to each company individually and have them remove the increase. Um, and so that's what I've been having to do recently for clients. Um, or a lot of times I don't even get her. I haven't even been getting responses from the bureaus most of the time. I'll see the action on the credit report or whatever. <laughs> And that, I'm only laughing because that's been pissing me off. But um, so if you, I always tell y'all don't skip steps. Um, however, with inquiries, I mean, you could just petition the company directly. Like, hey, listen, I pulled a copy of my credit report and I'm noticing that you all are reporting an inquiry from me. Um, can you please provide me a copy of the credit application that I filled out or anything where I gave you consent to pull a copy of my credit report? Um, if you can't provide it, please remove the inquiry from my credit report. Thank you. Um, and what you're doing is you're playing off of something called the law of permissible purpose. The law of permissible purpose states that a company has to have your expressed consent or written authorization um, to request a copy of your credit report. And so if they can't prove to you that they have that, then they have to remove the item from your credit report. So to answer your question, like time-wise, it varies. It really just depends on that initial response. That first response from the credit bureau is going to determine whether or not it's going to gonna take a while. And don't, LOL, squeeze a lemon. It might help. Blah, I'm not putting no lemon in the tea if I can't put no sugar in there. Ew. <laughs> first of all, you guys not con Listen, I thought I was going to get through a whole live where somebody don't talk about my accent. We is not doing this. If you remove items, are you still obligated to pay them? Yes. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. Oh my God. I wish, I wish somebody would ask me this question every live. Just because you get these items taken off your credit report does not absolve you of that debt. And I hate that that is a lie that's going around TikTok. You don't have to pay your Listen, what they're not telling you is that yes, these items can come off temporarily because they're under investigation. But what they're not telling you is that once the investigation is complete and the items validated and they repopulate on your credit report, you still owe these people. Even if you have, okay, so let's talk about it. If you have a collection and you dispute it and you win the dispute, they do not have everything that they need to collect on this debt. Do you know what then happens? They stop reporting. They stop trying to collect, but they sell the debt to another company so that they can try their hand. And the reason why is because you still owe that debt. That debt is still owed. It's just that they can't collect on it. I've done, so if you're on TikTok, I do have a series called How to Catch a Credit Guru. And I'm going to get back into it. I've been super, super, super busy with a lot of stuff. You guys are going to be so proud of me. Um, but I think, um, where I was exposing some of these people, like a lot of y'all be tagging me in these videos. And I've been missing them lately. So I'm going to go back and go through my, um, I'm going to go back and go through my tags again too. But um, a lot of y'all will tag me in videos of other credit repair specialists asking me, is this true? And so what I do is I'll use those tags to create that content. So when they're telling you things that are not entirely true, or if it's a flat out lie, then I'll go ahead and disprove it or explain in greater detail, because that's how a lot of these people are getting popular on TikTok. They're only telling you bits and pieces. I'm glad you talked about that because I see so many TikTok videos about removing collections without paying. Man, y'all, let me tell y'all, I cannot tell y'all how many people 
signed up for services with me and then saw a video like that and then didn't want to do services no more. Oh no, it's lagging. Hmm. Hmm. Let's see. Is it still doing it or is it better? Okay, it's fixed now. These gurus have us thinking that getting them wrong. Yeah, that's, but see, that's how they trick you. So let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> let's talk about it for a second. So the, how these credit repair specialists and why they get so popular, right, is because especially with the pandemic, right, so many people have bad credit right now and it sucks, right? It fucking sucks. But they're playing off of a lot of y'all being desperate. And I don't want to say naive, but a lot of you just don't know any better. And so when you don't know any better and you're desperate for a solution, anything that sounds good to you, you're going to fall for it. And so they tell you exactly what you want to hear. Yo, all that money you owe, you don't have to pay it. Sign up with me. And so the, uh, then they'll be like, you know what? You don't even got to sign up. I'm going to teach you how to do it yourself. And then they teach you how to do it yourself and it don't work. And so you be like, you know what? You know more than me. I'm just going to hire you to do it for me. And then boom, that's how they hook you. They only tell you a piece of the story so that it never works out in your favor. And then they use that to get you. They'll be like, hey, so how's it going? Or, you know, what's up? And you're going to be like, man, I tried this and it's just not working. And they'll be like, hmm, maybe you ain't do it right. Sign up for my services and I'll do it for you. That's how they get you. That's it. <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker. That's how they get you. Because they only tell you a piece of the story. This is why I make, I'm, I get on y'all ass about knowing the laws yourself so that they can't finesse you like this. That way, even if you hire somebody to fix your credit, you know what should be happening. Hey, you said you just joined in. So um, whatever you missed, after I'm done going live, you can go on YouTube and you can watch it. My YouTube channel is WWTMPD. What would the money plug do? So since getting them removed doesn't solve the puzzle entirely, wouldn't pay to delete be better? The only thing is you can only do a pay to delete with a collection account. You cannot do pay to delete with um, the original creditors. So charge offs and things like that. You can't do pay to deletes with them. Um, and so that's why a lot of people are like, well, I just want to get this repo taken off. Or I just want to get this charged off credit card taken off because so, you can't do a pay to delete. You can only settle um, because with these companies, they have an obligation to report. Um, and that means the history associated with the account. So not just the charge off, but all the years of on time payments, missed payments, whatever you have for that account. All of that, they are obligated to report. <laughs> okay, you dropping gems. I'm trying. What other questions y'all got for me? I'm in such... Listen, I had such a good time this weekend for my birthday. Such a good time. So y'all probably got me for like another hour because I'm hype. I'm well rested. Um, no, my husband probably gonna come in here and kick me off once he done playing the game. It just seems strange. Yeah, it sounds too good to be true. But when you're desperate and you're in need, you just fall back. I mean, you just you just fall for it. So if it get dropped off, do it always come back? Not always. There are times when um, it won't repopulate necessarily under that company because maybe that company didn't have what they needed to collect on that debt. And so what will happen then is that um, it's usually sold to another company or sent back to the original creditor. And then the original creditor may pursue you again or it's sold somewhere else. So exactly how hard is it to get a repo removed? I can't answer that because it all depends on your repossession. A lot of people don't understand that either. It's mostly situational. When you're doing factual disputing, it's mostly situational um, because you need to look at how your repossession is reporting and you need to look at how your repossession was conducted and you have to identify an inaccuracy, an error or a uh, violation of the Fair Credit Reporting Act or maybe a violation in how the repossession was uh, handled so that you can identify whether or not it was legal um, how they conducted the repossession because you can use the legality of the repossession to have that removed as well. I just want my utilization under 30%. Gosh, girl. Is there a catch-all service that lists all your debts? Because I see discrepancies across the top three. So here's the thing. A creditor does not have to report to all three bureaus. They don't have to. But 
the ones that they are reporting to, it needs to be the same information across the board. Now, one report that's going to have a lot more than what you bargained for, but it's going to have all the information you're looking for, it's called your LexisNexis. I highly suggest all of you request a copy of your LexisNexis. Just do it. When I tell you it be so many pieces of paper, I don't even think they mail it no more. I think they email it to you now. They don't even mail it anymore. It be so many pieces of paper. Jesus. I have a credit card closed 2017. I want to do a pay to delete with collections, but I'm concerned it will affect me to go for a house in six to eight months. So if you are doing a pay to delete, then what's going to happen is that the account will be removed from collections. So how collections work is when you pay a collection outright, just, just throw money at it and pay it, it's going to be stuck on your credit for seven years. Um, and you're not going to get any points back because you don't lose points for a collection due to how much you owe. You lose points when you have a collection because you have a collection. So following that same logic, when you do a pay to delete, you're giving them money in exchange for them not reporting this anymore. So that means the account will be removed from collections, which means all the points that you lost for having it in collections, you'll get those back because the account is no longer in collections. Does that make sense? So a pay to delete with a collection is the best thing you could get. However, you just want to be careful because what you don't want is to validate that account um, and risk resetting the statute of limitations. Yes, LexisNexis, L-E-X-I-S-N-E-X-I-S. It's so confusing trying. Oh, I'm sorry, Facebook. I did not see these comments. So if you get collections off of a credit report, do you still need to reach out to each agency to do a pay to delete so it doesn't come back? So it depends on how you had it removed. So if you did a debt validation and they came back and said, hey, you know, you requested these items. We cannot provide these items. We will no longer report or attempt to collect. Have a good day. It's too late. They didn't already got rid of it. They're not going to touch it. What's gonna, likely going to end up happening is they're going to sell it to a new company. When it gets to that new company, whenever a new co debt collection company buys the debt, you enter something known as the Dunning period. In the Dunning period, you have 30 days from whatever the date is on your letter that they sent you to dispute the validity of that account without it reporting to your credit. And so what you'll do is when you enter the Dunning period for this new debt, you're going to send them, you're going to send them a letter with a copy of the company that just admitted they didn't have everything they need. Um, and you're going to be like, listen, Right. I put a copy in my, uh, I, I'm, I mean, I received a notification in the mail. I'm noticing you're saying that I owe you money now. I know for a fact you're not going to be able to validate this debt. So I'm going to do you a favor. I got $200. That's all I got. I'm going to give you this $200 and you're going to stop reporting this account to my, to my credit report. Take it or leave it. They know that they don't have everything that they need. You have proof they don't have everything they need because this last company that they bought the debt from, the people they got all their paperwork from, like... <laughs> This is proof y'all don't have everything y'all need. So you can take this money and you can consider this dead. Don't sell it no more. Nothing. Or we can duke this out and you're not going to win. Choice is yours. It's so confusing trying to navigate the LexisNexis website. So you're in the Facebook group. If you Google LexisNexis in the Facebook group, then there is a link. Should be where you can request a copy of your LexisNexis report. I, I, re, I remember making a post with the link and you literally click it, fill it out, done. Okay, so how can you not validate the debt when trying to do a pay to delete? Literally, you'll say, hey, I pulled a copy of my credit report and I'm noticing that you're reporting that I owe you a debt, that I owe you a debt. I'm about this debt, but I need, it, I need this removed like today. So if I give you X amount of dollars, can you stop reporting this to the credit bureaus? Um, if you accept, uh, if you accept this offer, go ahead and write me back. You know, we'll, we'll talk details. We'll talk Turkey. Um, if not, then I'm going to ask you to validate this debt. Oh man. Um, what if the original creditor sent it directly to the creditor and didn't give you the opportunity? They don't have to. So once an account is considered charged off, they don't have to keep it. They can sell it to a, a, a debt collector immediately. That's their prerogative. They just have to give you the opportunity to... They have to give you the opportunity to pay. One second, y'all. One second. Hello? Hello? Yeah.
Oh, okay. Give me two seconds. Let me end this live, and then I'm going to call you right back. Okay. Sorry. I got enough time for one more question, and then I got to go answer this phone. There we go. Uh-oh. No, Instagram, no. Damn it. Okay. Cancel. Nope, Instagram is not going to. Okay. Instagram is just not going to let me do it. All right. I got time for one more question, and then I got to go. My PlayStation name is T-H-E-E Money Plug. I changed it so that y'all can find me. Thank you, Lisa. You guys are so welcome. Um, Again, so I normally go live on Fridays at 8 o'clock. Y'all know I don't know how to tell time. I'm always late. Um, but I always try to go live throughout the week to answer your questions. If I'm not live and you have a question, please feel free to DM me on Instagram. I try to get back to them. Or there's an email me button um, on my Instagram where you can shoot me an email. Um, or you can always just drop it in my Q&A box. But I'm going to go ahead and get out of here, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all of the support and all of the questions and stuff. And I will be seeing you guys soon.